Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And for today's incredibly engaging and uh, personable roundtable, we've got Tate Litchfield from FrontierPropertiesUSA.com. Tate, how are you? Doing well, really well. Thanks, Mark. We got the Zen Master, Mike Zeno. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. Doing great, very good. great. Shh. We've got the Facebook whisperer, David Banalis. David, how are you? Life is good, Mark. And we've got, got not pro, Eric Peterson from Landopia. Eric, we've got to give you a new nickname. How are you, Eric? I'm doing good. Happy to be here. And uh, at least you're not wearing your Team Scott shirt. And most importantly, <laughs> if you aren't automating your Craigslist postings, you know him. You love him. Scott Todd. Scott Todd.net. Postingdomination.com forward slash land geek. And now we're listing our properties on landmoto.com. Scott, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's been a good week of sales. Steady, steady, steady. Um, every time we send out an email, sale, sale, sale. I'm loving it. Um, but we have a, a little issue because we saw this in flight school. And I just wanted to kind of get everybody's take on it. And it is the dip, right? Because when you first start in land investing, what is the toughest thing to do? The list. Get the list, scrub the list, price the list. And inevitably, something happens, right? Either your VA doesn't understand your training instructions with the list, or you, know, you don't get your pricing right, maybe, or it's really hard to get the list. There's a number of issues. And ultimately, this is frustrating, right? Um, so let's talk about how we deal with that dip and, um, and how we get through it. So let's start with Eric Peterson. Eric, when you first started in the business, how did you deal with that inevitable dip? Um, I think that ultimately it, it's, um, you know, you have to be determined that the business, it sounds really simple. It sounds like, you know, you're just going to create all kinds of cash out of, you know, selling this property and, um, you know, so it's, there's only a few steps and all this. And um, the reality is um, it takes a lot of work. Uh, it, it takes determination. I mean, working with VAs, getting your processes so that they can understand them. So you're not, you know, the only one that can understand it and, um, refinement you know um it's it's an ongoing process and ultimately i think you just you have to be committed to it and just and stick to it you know keep keep plugging away little by little and uh that's that's how i made it through it yeah how about you mike zeno well when you talk about the dip um it makes me think about pretty much Anything important you do in life, whether it's you change your dietary habits or you go to start an exercise program, you know, the first few weeks are always great, right? But then you hit that point where it's like, oh, you know, it becomes very difficult. And those are the moments that make or break you. So this business is very similar. It's the same thing, actually. You know, it's, you know it starts out a certain way, but then it comes to points that challenge you. And that's because... It takes so long. I think I forget maybe thirty days. Whatever. Develop a new habit, right? You have to do it consecutively for so many days and repeat it over and over again. And a lot of what we do in this business is habit repeating. We're doing, you know, twenty mailings a day, as Scott always teaches. You know, we're doing things consistently over and over again. But ultimately, it's going to come to a point initially that you're going to come against a wall, which is kind of like you haven't developed that habit yet. You're working on it, so. I think you just have to push through it and recognize that you're close to a big breakthrough at that point because you're really at the critical point where you're going to create that new habit if you persevere and stick with it. But if you don't, it's over. <laughs> and it and wants to be over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how, how high the stakes can become in the dip, right? Um, David Benalis, how about you? Oh, David, you're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Frank. I've had so many dips now. <laughs> it's just part of my routine. Uh, but I, I do remember a lot in early on. Uh, and it was frustrating, like, to the point of, like, pulling my hair out. Like, But I had to burn the boat, so I had no choice but to keep plowing forward. And then some days it'll go smooth, and then it'll be a grind. But I just, you know, I, I grew up 
knowing that everything's for a season and this too shall pass. So whatever dip I was in, I knew it wasn't going to last for long. Yeah. How about you, Tate? Uh, you know, I feel like Tate is like the anomaly here. Like you could no, have no, 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 no. like just doing deals. It's yeah, like, but- it's like you were born doing deals. Here's the thing, Mark. You know, the dip hits you at first, but it's not like the dip's a one-time thing. And I think that's something that we forget about is that you can have multiple dips and they can be very, very deep even after you've been established for a long time, right? Like, you know, you might not – you might be in a position where you are having sales consistently, but you're not hitting the numbers you want. And that's a dip in itself because you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm just treading water. I'm not progressing. I'm not reaching my goals. And so I believe that that's a dip. So, you know, the way that you get through these dips is you, sometimes you just have to put your head down and just embrace it and just keep doing what you know will eventually work. And this is a numbers game, right? It's all about staying focused, staying on top of things, doing what the other people around you have proven to work. If you do it enough, you're going to get the same results as that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I love one of the, the modules that Scott Todd does at boot camp. And he, he walks everybody through his his journey starting with the business. And, and in the very beginning, it's really, really rocky, right? And he's all excited and he's going to the mailbox. And the first thing he does when he opens the mailbox is he gets all the return mail, right? And his wife is doubting him and he's doubting himself. And sure enough, he comes out of it, but it was a real dip at that point. So Scott, how did you deal with that? I just did more of the dip, meaning like when, whenever you hit these dips, like let's say it's mailing and you're not getting the response that you want. Well, the, the easiest solution to that is to mail more. If you're, if you're placing ads and you're not getting the response that you want, the solution is to place more ads. You have to change it. Because if you're not changing it, then you're going to get the same exact result, but you have to do more of it. You have to, Mark, as you say, embrace the suck, right? So you have to lean into those pieces that are, um, that are your pain points right then and just do more activity around it to get, to get through it. Right, right. I feel like in a, in a way Mike Zeno has this sort of intrinsic advantage that none of us have where, you know, sometimes like I know I don't feel like doing something, right? Um, where Mike doesn't have that luxury of, oh, I don't, I don't feel like going to that burning building and saving those people's lives today, right? Like he has to do it, right? <laughs> and now after you do it enough times, it's a habit. And pretty much everything in life after that, like you don't, you're not scared of anything anymore, right? The fear of loss or the fear of sort of almost anything kind of pales in comparison to the fear of losing life, limb, and your buddy, right, next to you. So Mike... When you first started saving lives and kind of doing this, these, these sort of unnatural things, um, how do you do it? I mean, you know what? There's probably days you don't feel like going into the building. Right. Yeah, there's, you know, the thing is that I've learned, and it, it took me a while to figure this out, and I think it holds true in all areas of life. It, you know, I say it, it's, uh, you know, going to a fire scene or going on a call, it's all about recovery. Nothing is ever the same. So it's always going to be a different set of circumstances that you can't just account for every possible what if. So it's always going to be something different, and you always have to be in that quick recovery mode. You always have to adjust and adapt and overcome to what's happening. So it's the same thing uh, in this business. You know, there's going to be deals that are all going to be intrinsically a little bit different. They're all cookie cutter, all the same, and you have to be have a set of skills you develop through habit that allows you to push through them and to, you know, find the way to make it happen. So um, I think that really does help for me is realizing that there's no perfect situation. Everything we do is all about recovery. It's just a matter of how quickly you recover, right? I mean, it could be I, I had someone tell me one time, it's like you could take like a Navy SEAL, you could take an average person, you could walk up to them and go boo and scare them, right? And they'll jump. But how quickly they recover is going to come upon their training and their skill set and their experience. So it's the same thing with all of us. You know, we, we all have the initial, oh, wow, this is something different. But we recover very quickly because we practice this over and over again and there are habits that are ingrained in us and we know just how to push through and make the deals happen. So I think if you just recognize it's not perfect and then that's okay and that's the way it is, and then you just kind of live in that moment and do it. Yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's, I think is also interesting about that dynamic is that we've sort of taken that dynamic and replicated it, right? 
with our community in flight school, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're go you have accountability with your own, you know, fire station, right? right? I mean, you may not feel like going into that building, but those other five guys are gonna be like, Mike, we're all going in. You're going in, <laughs> yeah. right? Like you can't sit this one out, and either can they, right? right. Because you got to deal with them afterwards. And the same thing happens in the community, right? Where we're there sort of backing each other up, but it's like, wait, what do you mean you didn't get your offers out? Like we're doing it, like especially in flight school, like we're doing this as a class. We sink and swim together. Like, no, you, you're almost shamed into doing it in a way, which is, I mean, it's just weird to say, but you'll do it. I mean, David Benalis, is that, uh, I mean, how you feel? That's a fair summary. I mean, ultimately, everyone has to take personal responsibility for themselves and not, you know, take you know, responsibility for your success and for your failures. But I think, you know, being a cohort program, you, know, you want to see your peers succeed and you, you don't want to be that weak link or you don't want to be the one person that, you know, took seven weeks to get offers out. So, yeah, I think the accountability and, like, this is a great model. I, I honestly wish I had started with flight school. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, so that kind of, you know, flight school, the first flight school is ending, ended last, last week. week. Um, what, what was that like, David? Yeah, so I got to sit in. Uh, thanks, Scott, for allowing me to do that. So uh, be a fly on the wall for that last class when Scott really pulls back the curtain and shows you the entire, his, the way his business is set up. And, man, it's machine. Like, it inspired me. Like, I took action that night to move forward uh, a process I was – kind of taking my time with I just launched it uh, a couple of days ago it's so awesome like I, I would just take you know flight school for that one one particular week <laughs> so, Scott Todd how do, how do you feel at the end of flight school you've got these investorlings right they start off as sort of you know uh, baby investors and then through the process they're getting all grown up and they're ready to leave the nest yeah um, What's that like for you? You know, Mark, the, the last class, as David said, is like the pullback of the, of the curtain. It's the capstone of, of the entire thing. It's, it's the collection of everything that they learn. And hopefully what they see throughout the, the whole process is that, okay, you know, week one, they can't see where it's going to go. Week 11, they're, they're focused on what we're, I'm sorry, week nine, they're focused on what we're teaching in week nine, which is, uh, in that case, it's like financial management. And then they get to the very last session where we pull back the curtain and we just talk about everything. And it's like, okay, well, remember when we talked about this in week one? This is how it gets done in my company. In week two, this is how it gets done. Week three, week four, all the way through, it all ties back and it all weaves to all of the content that we've shared along the journey. And, you know, my, my, last, my last piece to them, which is really like, okay, now, now go do I leave there and I'm even more energized because everything while I'm teaching that and like drawing it back out again, I'm wondering like, is this the right way for me to be doing it or can I improve on what I'm already doing? So it's, it's a great process, not only I think to go through as David said, but even to kind of teach it because it really makes you think like, is this really the best way that I can run this business or can I do it even better? Right, right. And, you know, Eric Peterson, when you first started, you were kind of a DIYer. And then you're like, wait a second. I know there's, I've got some FOMO here going on. I know these guys have some systems and processes and some geeky software. and They're going to get me to the next level. And in one quarter, you made more money than you did in your entire 12 months. But was the accountability of having that coach um, also a factor in it? Or was it the tools and the systems that, that got you there? Like, what, what was the difference for you in the one-on-one -on -one coaching? Um, I think it was, it was multiple factors. Uh, the accountability with, uh, with my coach was great. Um, you know, the information that was uh, shared through those calls was definitely helpful. And, you know, there's a number of systems and tools that, that I implemented um, fairly quickly based on, you know, what I, what I learned from that. And, you know, I think also just the commitment, the financial commitment, you know, I mean, you have to take it serious, you know, I mean, if you're putting up money to pay for coaching, I mean, there's, you know, you, you need to succeed and you need to, you know, 
figure out how you're going to make that money back. And um, I think all those factors played a role in it. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Zeno, what, what advice would you give yourself from three? You've been in this three years now? Yeah. Three years. Right, right, yeah. Right around three years. What, what advice would you give your, your three-year-old self when you first started? I guess you weren't three, but what advice would you give yourself when you started three years ago? That was, a, that was an interesting phrase. <laughs> when you were just learning to walk, what advice? I guess you, well, you're three, you already know how to Stand walk. Stand closer to Scott Todd. <laughs> yeah. No, he yeah. took off. Like, you know, he's inspiring. You know, Scott and I started around the same time, and, you know, he got those systems in place. And, you know, it's the people who get the systems in place sooner – succeed quicker you know and that's it you know you just have to really follow through with that so what i would have done is i would have stuck closer to him to be honest with you i would have i would have fly on his back and watch what he was doing uh, you know the, the instruction that he's offering in these flight school is is really that type of thing too it's it's all about how do you take because anybody can do one deal and and you know over time and sell it but that's not going to move the needle for anybody. You had a deal, do multiple deals, a massive amount of deals, and your system should not be affected by it. It should be smooth flowing right through from left to right, from the buy side to the sell side. And once you have that in place, then you become scalable, and then you become really profitable, and life gets a lot better. So I think that's the advice I would have given myself. I love it. I love it. Well, let's move on to a new topic, which uh, is sort of near and dear to like Tate's heart for sure which is negotiating. So I want to talk about sort of the recent case study um, that Scott and Todd had with negotiating with a trust, which we don't talk a whole lot about. We kind of talk about negotiating, but here's specifically negotiating with a trust. So Scott, tell us a story, and then we'll kind of talk to the roundtable group about how they deal with their negotiations as well. All right. So the, this ha I've done this twice, and in both scenarios, uh, the situation has been that the land was purchased by the parents. They put it into a trust. Both the parents have deceased. And now the children are faced with having to get rid of this land that they don't want. And uh, frankly, they, they're, they're baffled as to why mom or dad or both even bought the, bought the land in the first place. So typically they'll say, well, you know, I've got like six of these properties, two are in this county, two are in this county, three over here. Do you want them? And in both situations, what happened was I bought the land in the counties that I was already working. So when it came to time, like time to like, well, do you want this land? I'm like, well, I don't even buy property in that, that county. And I tell them like, hey, let me go through and buy what, you know, th this land first, and then we can talk about the rest of it. And they're like, okay, okay, no problem. So then what happens is we complete the sale. And then they come back to me and they go, hey, wait, wait, we still have like this one or these two or, you know, these three. And I'm like, yeah, okay, well, look, I really don't buy land in that county as I told you before. And um, for me to actually buy it, uh, you know, it just simply means I would buy it and then I have to find somebody that I can wholesale it to and they still have to be able to make money for it. So the most I can pay for those properties are $100 each. And two out of two times, they've said yes. So I literally picked up like four properties for $100 a piece. And these are like quarter acre to, um, to even half acre properties for like $100 a piece in Florida of all places. Right? I mean, your, your margins are on that are ridiculous. <laughs> so again, it gives me the ability to like wholesale if I want to or, you know, find people that, that absolutely want the cheapest land ever uh, and sell it to them at the assessed value. But I really got that idea from, from Mike, Mike's, Mike Zeno's wording of, hey, look, just going to be honest with you, I, I'm going to buy this, but I'm only buying it because, you know, I'm trying to help you out here, and I'm going to end up having to wholesale this. So I have to be able to make a little bit of money. They have to be able to make some money. This is the most we can do, take it or leave it. It's magic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, well, I'll, I'll kind of talk about the, the sort of maybe – uh, moral dilemma someone might have with that. But Tate, when you're negotiating um, and you're going through this process, right, what, what other levers do you use to get your price? I mean, I'll use just about anything is, uh, you know, oh, it's located off a dirt road. You know, that's going to, that's a, you know, that's a downside. For some people, that restricts who can actually buy the property and get to it. 
So I'll use that, back taxes, anything I can think of. Sometimes I'll just say, you know what? We changed our mind. <laughs> We're not offering you $1,000 anymore. The new price is 800 And how often do they come back at you? We, renew we renegotiate 100% of our deals. And the closing ratio? How often uh, do they say no? Well, if they say no, then we'll – no skin off our back, but I would say it's yeah, less than 10%. I mean, it's not even noticeable. Right. David and Alice, what do, you, what do you say to the person that's, that's listening to this and says, well, geez, it sounds like these land geeks are stealing people's land, um, taking advantage of them, uh, not all, at all in the name of their own profit. What do you say? Oh, no way. We provide so much value for someone looking to liquidate. So scenario, someone – owns a piece of property. Um, I got this exact scenario right now. Um, he's going through dementia, so the brothers help coordinate that with power of attorney. The daughter is strapped for cash. They need to, they're struggling. So sure, they can go to a realtor, sell the property. It might take three, four, five, six, seven months, and there's no guarantee, but for someone that needs cash now, we're providing a great service for them. Yeah, and by adding value, we're gonna profit from it. I mean. That's how this world works. Like you have to add value in other words, in order to receive money. We're adding a lot of value, and we're getting compensated, you know, for that. So right, right. I mean, the the way I look at it is like I I love Apple products, right? I'm a huge Apple fanboy. But when it's time to upgrade, right? I can just walk into Apple and recycle my, you know, iMac or phone or whatever it is. Knowing I'm taking a big haircut on that price because I'm not selling it myself, right? Um, I'm saving time, and they're providing this service for me, and they're making it easy. And I think oftentimes we discount the fact that this is a huge problem for them. Um, maybe not even financially, just, just the mental bandwidth of having to deal with it, and we're removing that. Eric Peterson, how often do people, the sellers thank you? For buying the land, even though you're buying it 23 cents on the dollar? It, it happens on a pretty regular basis, actually. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes um, it's, it's older people that, that are in that situation. Well, I shouldn't say that, though. I mean, even sometimes when the land gets passed down in the family, I mean, they can be just as thankful. But, I mean, so often... Um, I'm solving a problem for them. They, they don't want the land. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to pay the taxes. They don't want to figure out how to sell it. And I'm coming in and I'm saying, you know, I'll take care of it and, you know, give you a check. And uh, so often they are, they are extremely thankful. Yeah, you know, I, I remember uh, about maybe six or seven years ago, I was at a sports bar with a bunch of buddies. You know how it is. You're watching the game, and everyone's kind of talking during commercials, and and somehow business gets brought up. Mark, how's how's business going? And it was the first time that someone just deeded me land for free, right? Um, it was just a you know, they owed back taxes to the point where I had to get it for free, and so I'm kind of bragging to them, like you know, I just got my first parcel of land for free, and I'm telling you. And at that table, they're all professionals. They're all doctors and lawyers. I was the only one in business. And they looked at me like, how dare you <laughs> take advantage of somebody and get land for free? And I, and I felt shamed about it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, maybe, I'm, maybe this is wrong, right? Maybe I should pay more. But I'm like, wait a second. They came to me. I didn't come to them. Like, they I, – I just said, look, this is how I can do it. And they did it. So – I'll never forget that. Now I, I sleep like a baby, but um, I digress. So now we are at the point in the podcast where we're going to put everyone on the spot and ask them for the tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. Tate Litchfield, what do you got? All right. So this is um... – this is something that I'm dealing with a lot lately. I have people going and seeing property and where this property is located, there's no landmarks. It's not been, there's no markers or stakes or anything like that in, in the area. And so I'm, I'm helping people 
basically identify the boundaries of their property. And a lot of people don't have access to some sort of GPS or anything like that. So I found an app that I've been recommending that people download. It's called easygps.com, or easygps, it's in the iTunes or the App Store. People can download it. And the thing that I like about it is you can put in GPS coordinates and as you walk, it will tell you if you're at that location. So I can go ahead and get the GPS coordinates from the county or from the GIS, send them to my buyer, and they're happy as can be because they can pace off their own property and know where their boundaries are. So that's something that I'm using. Um, there's a lot of other similar tools out there. I mean, even the iPhone maps, or it's got a it's got a GPS unit built into it. I really like this one though because it gives you it gives you a lot of other geeky data, but um, yeah, so a GPS uh, a system for your cell phone. It's called Easy GPS. Check check it out. You, you like this better than what three words? Yeah, because most people don't use what three words. They they don't even know what what three words are. Yeah, I mean I don't even know what what three words are, right? <laughs> it takes the GPS coordinates and it's crazy. Like, you go, I know, forget it. I mean you've tried to sell me on it so many times, and I'm like, why not just give them what they want? Mark, 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 Mark. <laughs> What three words is not like it's close, but it's not it's not as accurate as a GPS coordinate. It, it was great it's back in like three, 2008. Three square. Wow, Tate, when you cut, you cut deep. It was great <laughs> in like 2008. <laughs> no, how how nice to be so young. It was great when we didn't have like smartphones, Mark. That was I mean that was revolutionary back then, but. I can have a GPS unit on me at all times, and yeah, I mean, the people don't want to know what three words. They want the coordinates of their property, so give it to them. I feel like Eric Peterson right now. Let's just move on. <laughs> hey, hey, what, how do I find this? You go to Bird Brown Bear. Yeah. <laughs> what? Bird Brown Bear. It makes sense. Call, call Mark. He'll explain it to you. Oh, you can't reach him. All right. Let's just move on. Great, great tip. E easy GPS app. Check it out. <laughs> easy. All right. I know it's on the iPhone. I don't know. Is it on Android for those two or three users? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to Eric Peterson. Eric, what's your tip of the week? And by the way, after all this hazing I got, I can't wait to uh, displace my anger onto you. <laughs> all right. I'm looking forward to it. I think you're going to like today's pick. So, um, We've got uh, third quarter coming around the corner here um, for those of you doing the 12-week year. Um, I was getting ready and, and kind of thinking through some of my goals, and I came across um, this notebook or journal called the Best Self Journal. It looks like this. <laughs> it's, it's a little book. Does it look like this? Uh, yep. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Look like this. Yeah, I've got one of those. Oh, done. oh, Eric, that was a great tip two years ago. Thank you. <laughs> That's no, that, it. You, know, you know what though? Honestly, it, it is a great journal. Keep going, Eric. Sorry, <laughs> it's a great companion companion of the twelve week year. Oh my god. Yeah, you should give it uh, to your brutal, coaching man. students with the with the book. By the we do. Be a By, we do tool. that. By, we, we do that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> that's because Seth he just loved uh, the Seth is the one that told yeah. us about yeah. it. As soon as, we, as soon as he told us about it, <laughs> I bought it, and then I said to Danielle, I'm like, this has to be included with coaching. But it's a great I'm tip. I'm done. No more tips <laughs> of the week for me. I'm <laughs> I thought I had Wave a good one. a white flag. Put away the pistol. Man. All right. That's a great tip. Bestself.co, right? Yeah, I think so. Eric, don't worry. Maybe I'll start feeding you some. <laughs> yeah, I still can't win. Keep, keep your chin up. It probably would have gone the other way if Tate hadn't hazed me so hard. <laughs> so, it's all Tate's fault. It's all Tate's fault. Yeah. Listen, uh, man. Zen Master, Mike Zeno, what's your tip of the week? Well, let's just start off with a very simple little quote, as I like to always give. Uh, this Buddhist quote is, he is able who thinks he is able. So basically, going back to the, to the fact that if you <laughs> – that's a good one, Scott. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, 
Eric, Eric, from now on, just come up with quotes. <laughs> yeah. But you got to have a story behind How can you go wrong? <laughs> well, let, let's model Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> so anyway, the belief. Like, we might listen to these stories about us buying land so cheap and think that you can't. But reality is all of us, anybody listening who follows our system can buy land that's cheap and eventually have land gifted to you. And you don't have to feel bad about it because we are providing a service. Um, it goes back to the tactic that ta Scott was talking about, and which I call buttering the bread. Basically, you're, you're making the deal. You're, you're padding the deal. You're taking the value away. We talk about this all the time when um, – uh, when we're selling property, right? Someone, you're not sure if they want to close, you pull the property back and then all of a sudden they can't have it and then they want it. Well, the same thing on the buy side. If all of a sudden you're not interested, um, that creates this kind of, uh, re kind of reverse psychology on the individual. I had a, a gentleman and, and a husband and wife, they were, um, we were buying a property for them. They started giving my, you know, all these details about getting the deed signed, started giving my acquisitions manager, manager a hard time. It was a little rude, so I, I just called up, left them, and I said, listen, you know, I understand this, you know, you guys are a little confused or whatnot, but my acquisitions manager, is, she's a wonderful person. I don't think anybody should be spoken to like that. I'd rather just not even have the land at this point. I think you should just keep the land. I'll keep my money, um, and let's let's just let's just part ways like that, you know. And what showed in my mailbox the next morning uh, in my email was the scanned PDF of the signed deed. It was like boom, done. I mean, I think that you just have to realize that all these things we talk about on this podcast all the time is we're all capable of, right? It's something you just it's a new it's a it's a new normal for you. If you just kind of focus and do what you're taught, you will learn how to do these kind of negotiations and you will also buy land ridiculously cheap and sell it for huge profits and sleep well at night because there's nothing wrong with what we do. We provide a very valuable service on the buy and sell side. All right. I love it. I love it. I've already just placed all my anger on Eric, so, <laughs> so on. I gotta always go after Eric. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge advantage. A huge it advantage. is. <laughs> the Facebook whisperer, David Banalis. What's your tip of the week? My tip of the week is we're gonna get Mike Zano to just record a bunch of audible books for us. Because I just <laughs> I just felt so peaceful listening to him. <laughs> so Eric, this is my tip to you. I always have a book, an obscure book, right? So a book that they probably haven't read. This way they can't rip it, okay? So fanatical prospecting. I always have at least one or two sales or marketing books going. Uh, this is one I'm kind of dragging out on purpose because it's so content dense. So this morning I was listening to it and, you know, am I talking to my Uber drivers about land? Like this is how crazy it should be. Like, are you practicing your pitch well enough to talk to your Uber driver about land so that's my next i'm going to sell a property to my uber driver next you know, you know what's so funny is um 15 percent of the time that i take ubers by myself i sell a toolkit <laughs> i love it because they ask me inevitably like what do you do and i tell them and they're like oh my and uh and they buy it so <laughs> I have an amazing <laughs> Uber closing ratio. And technically speaking, I should really only, I should sell my cars and just take Ubers. Um, You'd make a lot more money. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Um, but that's a really good market, <laughs> actually, <laughs> for, uh, for the toolkit because they're already doing a side hustle, right? It's like, well, if I'm going to do a side hustle, why don't I make, you know, 100 times more money and have passive income and value my time? It's like, well, this is easy. I mean, it's not easy. It's simple. It's not easy. So yeah, I've I've applied that for this land business, and I was at Robin's Bros a few months ago, and before I know it, they had a call scheduled with me. So yeah, I mean, I'm deadly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's really funny. And actually, when uh, almost almost any time I buy anything now, um, the sales guy who asked me what I do, like, calls me a week later, <laughs> right? He's <laughs> like, hey, um, by the way, I'm really interested in what you do. Um, <laughs> I'm like, great. Uh, Scott Todd. Okay, so uh, a couple tip? things. A couple things. One, uh, that book that David recommended, he said he was dragging out. I think it's because it might be too slow. You know, so no one drags out a good book. Sorry, David. <laughs> second, that's second little, Mark. That's a, little, that's a little displaced anger. <laughs> it was it was an eleven hour book, man. <laughs> Man, this is a good point, Scott though. Todd, you, you, your, your confidence must be so high right now on this tip of the week. Mark, second, second. You should, you should be uh, like, like never driving your car to sell toolkits. Uh, like every ride, they will be paying you. That's phenomenal. It is. It's unbelievable. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So here, here's my tip of the week, which is check out this app called ScanPost, and you can learn more about it at ScanPost.io. And essentially what you can do is you can scan a letter, much like you can do with TurboScan or something else, but then you can basically mail it. So like forget having to like scan it and then even send it to click to mail or anywhere else. If you have something that you need to mail out to somebody, like I got this guy that every time he makes a payment, he wants a copy, even though he pays by check, he wants a, a receipt, okay? And he doesn't have email. So essentially what I, what I do is I write on a piece of paper, hey, payment received, copy of his check, and I use this to, to email to him the receipt. I don't even have to like worry about like double stepping. Right? How, much, how much do they charge, Scott, to, to uh, ship? Who cares? I don't know. I, I, I care. I want to know. Who knows? P well, because why don't I just use a simple postcard? Do the same thing. Well, it's a few bucks. Well, try it out. See see what you think. Well, I will. I'm gonna try it out right now. But I'm just saying, like, if it's five dollars, you know, stamp on it, right? To to print no, it. It's like it's like I think it's like less than a dollar additional or something. So it's it's cheap. So, oh, you send, did you send the email. Money. You send the email and it's already mailed to the. They mail yeah. it to the president. Yeah. Cool. Well, David, sorry, but that's a good tip. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a good I tried can't find a weak point in that one that was that's pretty good so go ride in an Uber Mark I'll go take an Uber after this call <laughs> that's, that's a great for idea sure um, wow all right well my tip of the week you know since we're on the I'm really I mean you know actually I'm scared like oh no what's Eric gonna say this is an actual addendum app to what Eric's bestself.co tip of the week was with the 12 week year. It is called journal five, the five minute journal. So it's five bucks, which um, for everyone listening to this probably is, you know, less than what their cup of coffee is. But every day I go on journal five and I can upload a picture. Like today I uploaded my family. I write the three things I'm grateful for. Uh, what will I do to, to make today great? I write the three things that will make today great. Daily affirmations, right? I know it sounds woo-woo. I am, but, um, you know, you write your, your, your affirmations. And at the end of the night, it reminds you, it's, it, it notifies you three amazing things that happened today. And I don't know about you guys, but, you know, it's really nice to kind of go back and read about your life. Right, even these just very simple things, and see like a year ago, like what made that day great, right? You, all right, upload up the picture of something that I did that day, right? Um, and kind of journal. It's like it's like journaling, super super fast. Five minutes. Eric Peterson, what do you think? <laughs> I don't what know. What is this website? <laughs> There's an app on the phone. It's it's an app. Uh, it's journal five. The five or the five minute journal. The five minute. Available on Android. Just so, so, you tell so him basically, <laughs> so you're doing that instead of using the best self journal. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm doing the best self journal as well. Okay. Because the best self journal um, is really great for the 12 week. I'll tell you what I have a problem with the 12 week with the 12 week journal. For the best self is my handwriting is so bad because I'm so not used to writing. Um, I have to do for me what I know what I do. Because, like, Scott and I used to argue about this. Because Scott would do, like, the Grant Cardone goal-setting thing, and he handwrite it really fast. And, like, I'm, I'm just a typer. I like typing. Um, I hate my handwriting. So, for me, I tried it, and I think it's great. Um, it just didn't work for me. So, you know, I'll try anything. If it doesn't stick, it doesn't stick, and I just move on. Yeah. You know? But it, for a lot of people, it's going to be great. So, what do you think, Scott Todd? I'm waiting for your your criticism of the, of the five minute journal. I, I mean, you know, like for me, it's a little too like, you know, grateful. I, I don't know. I don't really focus on what I'm grateful for. Maybe, maybe that's a mistake. I, maybe I should be doing that. I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, you so, basically you know. publicly just told everybody you're really not a happy person. Because <laughs> the happiest people are grateful. <laughs> I didn't say I wasn't grateful. I just don't, I just don't sit there and like write down like, oh, I'm so grateful for the blue sky today. 
I mean, I'm happy. I'm grateful for lots of things, but that doesn't mean I have to sit there and log it and journal it every day, like in my diary. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. That's like a personal attack. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, I think we need to. You know, I, you know, the, the journal is a journal. It's not a diary. So it's okay. five dollar nap, right? $5 yeah, th nap. this is a very macho thing that I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're connecting with yourself. That's great. Whatever. <laughs> all right, let's just move on. <laughs> I want to thank all the listeners. I want to remind everybody, um, if they want to learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training. And uh, July Flight School is filling up. So schedule a call with Mike or David. Learn more about that. Uh, the landgeek.com forward slash training. And, of course, today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io, the only automated set it and forget it financial CRM. Um, do not sign up for WePay or BluePay, even though – we have that as merchant integrations. For credit cards, only use authorized.net or Stripe. Only use credit cards for your down payments or cash payments, and then use Actum for your ACH payments. They're the only bank in the world that likes our business. So we have a huge advantage there. Geekpay.io, schedule a demo, learn more. Eric Peterson, how's Geekpay going? Great. See? Great. I just set up a new loan this morning. See? Easy, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank you guys um, for being on the round table. Tate Litchfield, FrontierPropertiesUSA.com. Eric Jotnot, Pro Peterson, Landopia.com. Mike, the Zen Master, Zeno, the Land Guru. David Benalis, the Facebook Whisperer. And last, SimpleLifeLand.com. Yeah. yeah. And last but not least, LandMoto.com. Scott Todd and PostingDomination.com forward slash LandGeek. Thanks, everybody. If you guys are getting value from the Roundtable podcasts, um, send us a screenshot of your review of the podcast at support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit. Thanks, guys. This was a lot of fun, as always. I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. And by yeah. the way, let freedom, freedom ring. ring.